My name is Cindy Murphy and I am a patent attorney. I am located, my offices are located in Cleveland, Ohio and I love entrepreneurs, needless to say. I especially love the entrepreneurs that are inventors because they get patents and patents are my passion. I have a presentation for you today that's called IP squared equals profits and I think we all know what profits are, that's why we start business. IP is the initials that are used to describe intellectual property and intellectual property is what goes on in your mind. It's the creative things that people come up with. It's the inventions, the ideas, uh, all of the creative things that you can't really touch or feel like you can with land or personal property like books and jewelry, but it's, it's in many ways much more valuable and intellectual property law, which I practice, is the way that you protect that so that at the end of the day you can get profits. One of the ways I like to look at this is that if you have an innovation, which is an invention or a new idea or something that somebody's never thought of before, you can turn it into a product. And you can also get a patent on it. And in most situations, if you have an innovation that's new, if you have an invention, you have to be able to make it into a product in order for it to actually be sold to anyone and or at least somebody has to be able to make it into a product and in most cases not all but in many cases it's going to be important that you get a patent or some type of intellectual property so that you can achieve profits at the end of the day one of the things that i think is interesting is people tend to divide the world up into big companies and entrepreneurs and there's a lot of big companies in, in Ohio that are making a lot, employing a lot of people, making a lot of prof profits, um, putting a lot of products out into the world and doing a really a whole lot of good things. But what's interesting about them is they all started as entrepreneurs. So if we go back to 1870, we have Henry Sherwin and Edward Williams, and they are going to come up with the concept of ready mixed paint. Before Henry and Edward, what you had was, if you wanted to paint something, you had two separate containers that then you had to mix together in order to make paint when you were getting ready to paint. You had to use the paint up by the end of the day. You had to mix it right before you were ready. So this meant that really painting was really confined to people that had the skill and the whereabout to do the ready mixing like they needed to. Um, from that invention, from that innovation, is going to come the product of ready mix paint. Today, we have Sherwin-Williams, which is the largest producer of paints and coatings in the United States, and if not the largest in the world. And they have over 400 issued U.S. patents. 1872, um, in the old days, if you look at the Western movies, Diebold was the company that made the safes that the banks would transport by the um, wagon and horses with all the cowboys protecting them from bank to bank. And all your Western movies involving robberies along the line had to do with getting the safe. Today, Diebold has over 400 issued U.S. patents. And if you think you're not familiar with this company, Next time you go to a auto banker where you take out money or you're there with somebody, look down and I almost guarantee there'll be a little Diebold sign there. They make all of the, almost all of the automatic cash dispensing and banking machines in the United States. 1879, we're going to have Thomas Edison come on the scene with light bulbs and he's going to invent the commercially practical light bulb. The interesting thing about Thomas Edison is he didn't invent the light bulb per se. It had already been invented. The problem was that it would only last for about 30 seconds or it would catch on fire and it was too dangerous to use. What Thomas Edison is going to do is make a light bulb that actually works. And today we have GE with over 3,000 issued U.S. patents. 1885, we have Winslow Fay. And one of the things that when the automobile is going to come on the scene, what's going to happen is people think that it replaced um, horses and horse-drawn carriages. And to some extent that's true, but in the cities, 
a lot of transportation was accomplished by the large three-wheel tricycles. And so when the automobiles start taking over, what's going to happen is there's going to be not such a big market for these tricycles. What Winslow Fay is going to do is transform his tricycle design into a wheelchair design and into carts that can help people with disabilities. Today, that company is called Invacare and has over 200 issue U.S. patents, and they make um, the, the, the wheelchairs that you see with the ele electrical and all of the things on them that really, really enhance the life of people with disabilities. 1895, we're going to have Benjamin Franklin Goodrich, who's going to found the Akron company that develops pneumatic tires suitable for cars. And pneumatic tires means that they're pumped up with air. There was tires before, but they were rubber and they were not pumped up with air. He's going to come up with a pneumatic tire. And today, Goodrich is a leading global supplier uh, to the aeros aerospace and defense industry, and they have over 4,000 issued U.S. patents. 1896, Joshua Lionel is going to invent a decorative lighting mixture that sort of t converts energy um, in the, a pot at plant into something that can light up and that's going to be the nemesis for the battery um, for Energizer and EverReady which today has their technology center in Westlake, Ohio and they have over 600 issued pass patents. In 1898 Frank Cyberlean is going to come on the scene and he's going to take an abandoned straw board factory in Akron and convert it into a manufacturing facility for bicycle tires, carriage tires, and horseshoe pads. And now this company is known as Goodyear and has over 4,000 issued U.S. patents. 1901, Timken, Henry Timken. Um, he's going to come up with bearing designs for using on wagons and carriages and things like that so that the wheels turn easier so you don't need as much force to pull them. And there's a lot of legend and fol fol uh, folklore surrounding uh, the Timken bearings. And one of them is, is that the way they tested this is they loaded up a wagon with a certain amount of weight and without the bearings it took six horses to pull it. With the bearings it took only two horses to pull it. So they knew that they had something with their bearings. The other part of that folklore legend is that they were arrested for animal cruelty when they made just two horses pull the carriage with all the stuff on it because something like that had never been accomplished before. Today, Timken is the leading global manufacturer of highly engineered bearings, and they have over 900 issued U.S. patents. In 1910, Irvin George Bailey is going to come on the scene, and he's going to develop the Bailey furnace indicator and the Bailey fluid meter. What this is going to do is allow the measurement of steam flow and other fluids that couldn't be measured before. The Bailey legacy is going to continue today as AB&B, who has over 80 issued U.S. patents. And in the industry, steam meters are still referred to as Bailey meters in honor of Irvin George Bailey. 1914, Joseph Eaton is going to move to Cleveland to manufacture a patented internal gear truck axle. And today that company is Eaton, still headquartered in, in Cleveland with over 6,000 issued U.S. patents. 1918, Arthur Parker is going to rent a loft in Cleveland to develop a unique braking system for trucks and buses. Today, that company is known as Parker Hannafin and has over 2,000 issued U.S. patents. 1928, um, there's going to be a group of entrepreneurs who are going to develop a lubricant to prevent car springs from creaking. And what's going to happen with automobiles is they're going to run very nicely, but they're going to be very loud because of the car springs creaking. And this is going to account for a lot of noise in the cities. And what they came up with was a um, lubricant um, and the concept of suspending graphite particles in oil for a lubricant that is going to allow cars to run more quietly. Today, this company is Lubrizol, and they have over 1,200 issued U.S. patents. 1930, um, you're going to have the Harshow Chemical Company is going to be the first manufacturer to develop scintillation crystals. And today, they are located out, they are St. Gobain, located in Chardon, Ohio, and they have over 100 U.S. patents. 
1930, James Picker is going to establish a Cleveland company to come up with different kinds of x-ray equipment for medical uses. Today, they are a global supplier of medical imaging equipment under the name Philips, and they have over 500 issued U.S. patents. 1933, we're going to have John Lincoln, who is going to create a patented flux which made a weld as flexible as steel. And what the important thing about that is, is that your weld has to sort of blend into the rest of your thing if you want to have your fracture analysis hold. And what's going to happen is that's going to turn in today Lincoln Electric, um, who is still the world leader in the design and development of welding, both automatic and manual. And they have over 100 issued U.S. patents. 1938, we're going to have Charles Cadwell, who's going to research a light and portable way of rail bond bonding, and that's for fixing the rails when they break, and he's going to invent that, and Erico is still in uh, existence today. Erico actually stands for Electric Railroad Improvement Company, and they have over a hundred issued U.S. patents. They, today they concentrate more on construction, construction products that are related to electrical stringing of electrical cables and things like that in construction, but still very much active. 1947, Fred Lennon is going to come up with a compression type fitting for fluid pipes that you can put pipes together. It's a substitute for welding. And today they are still going strong with over 400 issued U.S. patents under the na company name of Swedgelock. 1969, Alfred Moen, who called himself a serial inventor, he came up with the single-handed faucet with a replaceable cartridge. And one of the things he's going to do here is make it so that you can put hot and cold water through the same spout and today that company is Moen and is one of the world's largest manufacturers of faucets and other plumbing products and they have over 600 U.S. patents. 1985, Ray Krolovic is going to come up with a low temperature liquid chemical sterilization. Before this, the way you, this, this, relate, this invention relates to the sterilization of the doctor's surgical instruments before they, they perform surgery. And before Ray, what you had to do is there was a heated steam way of doing this that you had to have about a two hour lead on. And you also, there was a time period after it was performed that you had to actually use the, the instruments or they had to be re-sterilized. What this, what the steris method did was it steril, you could sterilize a few minutes before you perform the surgery so that you knew that they were sterile, perform the surgery, and then and that way you always had sterile instruments without having to have the lead time. Today, Steris is the world's, um, one of the world's leading manufacturers of invention, of, excuse me, infection prevention, decapitation, and other medical products. So that's an example there of companies that have used IP squared equals products. They had an innovation, they turned it into a product, and they got patents on it, and they um, then became profitable, and now they don't look like entrepreneurs anymore, but we all start as entrepreneurs.